Hello students, I'm Jan and today we're talking about functions and frames as part of our reverse engineering module of Pwn College. Let's roll. On a high level, what is a program? A program is a collection of modules, libraries, the main binary, or the main code, whatever, um, that are each made up of a number of functions. These functions contain blocks, collections of instructions that operate on variables and data structures and then trigger system calls and do whatever it is that your program is supposed to do to enable the functionality you know and love. Um, so the big thing here that we'll be talking about today is functions and uh, what they're made up of. Um, of course, modules, you know, uh, they're basic collections of functions shipped in, let's say, one library. Um, and uh, they're very frequently used uh, to make developers' lives easier. When you want to write uh, dynamic memory allocation, you don't have to write it from scratch. You can use libc um, and it's, uh, you know, malloc, free, and so forth. The nice thing, and the reason I'm talking about this uh, here, is that this makes it um, much easier to reverse. Typically, unless your reversing target is a um, uh, library itself, you don't have to reverse engineer library code. Libraries are well documented. You can uh, look up their documentation and understand uh, what a program that is using a library is trying to achieve with this library, right? So um, what we do have to reverse engineer often is the main module of the program. All right, so we've talked about uh, the modules that you know include these functions. Well, the functions um, themselves are, are more or less an atomic um, an atomic, my mind just went blank. An atomic, what's the term I'm looking for? I don't know. The modules are, are an atomic construct for reverse, or the functions are atomic construct for reverse engineering. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, a function has a well-defined goal usually, right? It has some functionality that it was written to implement. Uh, you might have a getter or a setter function, object-oriented programming. Your function might calculate something, uh, might dispatch other functions if it's, it parses input from a user or from a script or something. Um, and, and this typically uh, makes them uh, well-suited for being reverse engineered in isolation. Typically, you can open up a function, understand what it does, um, and having reversed other functions will help, of course, but there are, you know, you'll be able to find functions that make sense on their own. And as you reverse engineer more and more of these individual functions, you'll start to better understand uh, how they fit together. This understanding will emerge in your mind and eventually you will understand the software that you're reverse engineering. Um, what is a function? A function is made up of a graph. I mean, of course, you know that in, a, in an L file, a function is made up of instructions, but conceptually speaking, these instructions can be grouped into blocks that always execute together and edges that connect these blocks based on conditional and unconditional control flow transfers. Um, and a, uh, the resulting function can be viewed as a graph. Every execution of this function conceptually speaking, is a path through this graph, right? Um, so let's uh, look at uh, the right side of these slides for um, a, I, I, I implemented a very simple uh, version of cat, right? So all it does is it sits and uh, takes input and, and, and uh, spits it back out at you. And it's very simple. I wrote it in assembly, actually. First shot, it compiled and worked. I was very proud of myself. Um, and there's two functions, basically. There's the entry point of the um, elf uh, underscore start, and all it does is call main, and then it um, calls exit, right? And then there's the main function, um, and let's ignore the beginning here where, you know, it, it starts, and then the end where it returns for now. Um, we'll, we'll dig in to that more. Um, and just look at kind of the main body here. 
um, here we see just from the arrows, we can see that there's a loop that, that the function has a while or a for loop, right? And this makes sense. Cat sits there and as long as there's input, it still produces output. Um, and then you can see that uh, this, this line is blue. That typically means it's an unconditional jump that will always be taken. This line is green. This means this jump will only be taken if the uh, conditional jump, the condition uh, associated with the conditional jump is true. And this uh, jump will only be taken if the condition is false. And so, you know, the conditional jump doesn't trigger and we just keep executing. Um, so let's take a look at what this does, right? Here you can see, uh, if you remember from the shell coding and sandboxing modules, very familiar uh, setup of uh, the read system called RAX is zero, RDI is zero, it's reading from standard and input. Um, RSI is pointing at the stack um, and RDX is set to uh, 256, uh, which reads 256 bytes onto the stack. And then it checks, it compares the return value RAX against zero. And if the result is less than or equal to, if you recall from the assembly uh, foundations lecture, um, this is a conditional jump that checks the um, assigned comparison uh, between RAX and, and the zero, the last thing that was compared. And then if that is uh, less than zero or less than or equal to zero, so if read didn't read anything or just failed, then the function returns. Otherwise, it con execution continues, and here we see it sets up a write syscall, writes out what it just read to standard output, and then jumps all the way back. So you can see, just by following this graph and understanding what this graph does, uh, what this graph represents, we just reverse engineered this very simple program that I wrote. Of course, in reality, the programs we reverse engineer are going to be significantly larger. So we skipped over the beginning and the end. Um, functions have a beginning and end, of course, and they uh, have a, in the beginning a prologue and in the end an epilogue. Uh, the prologue sets up what is called the stack frame for the function, the epilogue tears it down. Let's dig into what this means first. What is the stack? Uh, this is something we've casually tossed around in uh, when talking about assembly. Well, uh, the stack is a memory region, right? If you recall um, from the fundamentals, uh, ELF um, binary, what is an ELF, uh, the fundamentals binary files lecture, an ELF has uh, three data sections where it can store data. That data is used for pre-initialized global writable data. That RO data is used for global read-only data. The .bss stands for, um, uh, or sorry, is used for uninitialized global writable data, right? So that's a lot of places to store global data, but what about local variables, right? Um, well, I'm glad you asked. Local variables live on the stack and the stack is used to store the local variables and also the execution context of the function. Um, the stack due to a historical oddity grows backwards. There are reasons why this is the case in terms of memory layouts on, on ancient computers, but uh, realistically we are left with a, a interesting and kind of weird situation where the stack uh, grows backwards. You can um, draw the stack either vertically or horizontally. I like to draw it horizontally because it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the stack starts on the left and then, or rather, well, this is funny because I already screwed up. Um, this, the, when the order of increasing memory is to the right and then the stack starts on the right, I'm mirrored in the video and then goes to the left. Um, the bottom line is when you push onto the stack, RSP is decreased by eight. When you pop from the stack, RSP is increased by eight. Um, so if you look at what happens when you push OX41, then push OX42, then push OX43, uh, I've drawn the stack here both horizontally and vertically so you can get familiar with it. Um, 
I'll use the horizontal uh, representation in most cases uh, because it's we can fit multiples of it on a slide and uh, see how stacks change and so forth. All right, so that is um, the stack. What's the initial layout of the stack when this when the program starts? Um, when the program starts, the stack holds all of its kind of initial inputs, the environment variables and the arguments, um, uh, both the, the values, pointers to the values and the um, number of arguments. So if you look at this situation here, if I have a program that I run with arguments, hello world, and there are three um, environment variables, then on the stack, along with some other things that, that we won't dig into right now, um, there is uh, the, all of the strings, null terminated strings, one after the other. And then there are these uh, string tables, they're called, basically uh, a series of pointers ending in a null byte. When you say, uh, and, and same, this holds for the environment and for Arg the arguments, argv, and you can see they, where they point to based on these arrows. Um, when you say argv zero, you are dereferencing the, um, the 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 first argument, right? When you do printf argv zero, uh, it it will take this pointer and pass it to printf, which will dereference it and then print this string. And then argc, of course, is the number of arguments at the top of the stack. All right, then what happens? Um, then when we call a function, uh, and for some reason this is wrong, one sec, let me fix it. All right, we're back. Uh, sorry, this was missing an orange square on the top here. When we call a function such as main, the address of the next instruction after the call is pushed to the stack. So the instruction that the callee that main should return to. So if you look the instruction uh, that the of where call main is, the address is 401050, the next instruction 401055, and that is what will be pushed to the stack when um, um, we call main. Okay? And then when main returns, it simply pops the uh, return address from the stack and jumps there. That's simple. That is what a return is. Um, you notice that there are no push and pop RIP instructions in this code. These are implicit pushes and pops. This is the difference between a call and a jump. A call uh, implicitly pushes something, a return implicitly pops it, whereas a jump actually just has a target where you jump to. All right, let's roll on. Um, there's also, aside from these return addresses on the stack, there are local variables. This is where the function stores its local variables. So at the beginning of the function, it sets up a stack frame where it will store local variables. Um, the frame uh, is built using two things, the stack pointer. The stack pointer always points to the leftmost side. I'm mirrored here. The leftmost side of the stack frame and the base pointer, which always points to the rightmost side. Um, this is done so that cleanup is much easier, as we'll see in a sec. So the prolog is um, we push the old frame pointer, what pointed to the old right side of the stack. Uh, you know, if if main had been called by another function that that had a frame pointer, um, so that we could restore it easier later. Um, and we move um, the current stack pointer, the leftmost side, into the frame pointer. So now the rightmost side and the leftmost side are pointing to the same location, which is the top of the stack, the beginning of this function's uh, um, uh, stack frame with the return address directly to the right of it. And then we subtract from uh, let me, for you, we subtract from the stack pointer uh, to create space on the stack. Now, uh, I have allocate in the slides in um, quotes. This is because no space is actually created. The space and the data in it was always there. We just now kind of conceptually uh, marked it as 
you know, within this function's stack frame because the stack pointer is pointing to the left of it and the frame pointer, the base pointer is pointing to the right of it. Cool. And then uh, the function executes, it uses its stack however it wants, and then it tears down this frame. And this is also very, very simple because of these base pointers, right? Um, we deallocate, and here again, I have quotes because the data is not gone, it stays around perfectly happily. We just moved the stack pointer to the right of that data. So that data is not really uh, kind of within the stack anymore. Um, but it's not destroyed. That's a very important thing that leads to a lot of vulnerabilities actually, is that that data um, stays around. So if, and first of all, it stays around when it, uh, the stack frame is torn down and it's not overridden with anything when the stack frame is set up. So you can lead to situations where data is reused when it shouldn't be reused and uh, sensitive data can be leaked. Um, anyways, uh, we deallocate the stack by, by resetting the uh, stack pointer, sorry, the stack pointer, which is on the leftmost side of the stack, to, point to, to be equal to the frame pointer, the base pointer, that used interchangeably, uh, that, those uh, terms, that is on the right side of the uh, stack frame um, and by just moving RBP into RSP. Um, we pop the old base pointer, so that we restore fully the old frame uh, of the function that called us. And now we are ready to return. Now the next thing on the stack is the return value. So the, when we read, it's, uh, it'll, it'll work properly. Um, one final thing uh, is there are now optimizations in modern compilers that can not use uh, that can enable using RBP as a general purpose register instead of the frame pointer. Um, so don't panic if you see something that does not use RBP to set up the stack that does operations directly on RSP. Um, so instead of move RSP RBP, it might add RSP 100. It will likely still push RBP because um, that is part of the calling convention. And in fact, the prologue you'll often see pushing other registers, which as we discussed in the calling convention, uh, part of the fundamentals uh, assembly lecture are callee saved registers and that it is considered impolite and improper to overwrite them uh, without restoring them within a function. Um, okay, that is uh, what a function is from both the code and the data perspective. Um, and uh, how it, the, the life cycle of a function as it lives and executes. Uh, and next we'll talk about the data and how to tell where different data is. See you next video.